In our last video, we did a battery and display replacement on an iPhone 12 mini using Apple's parts and their tools. This is part of the new Apple self-service repair program. These are the exact tools that they use inside the Apple Genius Bar. And while these tools help open an iPhone, I figured maybe I should help open these tools to see how they work and what's inside. Because I bet you it hasn't been done before, publicly. Maybe it has, YouTube's a big place. Anyway, let's do it. Starting with the simplest one. This is the battery roller something. I don't remember what they call this tool because frankly, it is so unnecessary and overkill. The idea, if you remember, is that once you performed a battery replacement, you need to actually get the adhesive to adhere. So you put this little tray in this track, you lower the lever, and then you use spring pressure to roll the battery into place. Uh, completely unnecessary. You could achieve this with a pair of fingers. Um, I'm presuming Apple does it to meet kind of fact factory or manufacturer specification but it is totally overkill. <laughs> With that said, I do want to show you how the device works because while very, very well machined, it is super simple. So you've got everything, you've got this track here, this allows you to align the tray itself, and then there's a nipple right here that allows you to align the tray in the track. The larger phones have multiple lanes. The iPhone mini we did a repair on just had a singular one because you know the batteries are larger. This is a uh, nylon or Delrin or something of the sort because it's machined. It's a really beautiful piece of plastic. And then it's sitting inside of this kind of linear rail that's uh, machined or extruded. It's extruded aluminum. And uh, all you do is when you press the lever down, it just slides up and down inside of this rail. So pretty simple. Uh, most of the action is done by this singular spring in the middle. And for stabilization, there is a pair of, uh, frankly, screws here that just hold this aluminum piece into place. And then this on the outside is a pair of linear rods that are inside of some bearings. All this does is slide up and down and that's it. Now we do know from uh, science that spring pressure increases as it compresses, it's non-linear. So at this very bottom point, there's very little spring pressure, but at the top point, there is an insane amount of spring pressure. What I've noticed from this tray on the iPhone 12 Pro is that it is a different depth from the iPhone 13, uh, excuse me, from the iPhone 12 mini. And presumably that's because these devices are different thicknesses, especially with the camera humps, and they need to apply the same consistent amount of force uh, when it's fully deployed. So that's it. Why did we talk about this? I don't know. It's so heavy, so nicely made, and so entirely overkill. Let's get to the fun tools, like this one. This is the display press. And if you remember from the last video, this was the only thing that I was actually super impressed by. <laughs> this tool's cool. I like this one. It's a really cool tool, even though its function is very simple. Uh, when you've put the adhesive inside the phone, you use this press to adhere the adhesive to the frame. And then once you've put the display on, you place this tray back in, you lower this handle, and it adheres the display to the adhesive, which is adhered to the frame. And uh, it holds everything together and ensures a perfectly watertight seal. There's a timer that counts down from 30. And then once that goes off, uh, there's a little buzzer and you pull this handle down, pull the peg out, and it goes back up and you're done. So again, the function is really, really simple, but the design is actually fairly complex. So I wanna kinda of try to take it apart as much as I can and see what's inside. Let's start here. This is uh, just a hydraulic damper. The whole purpose is for it just to return smoothly to its home position. That's, that's, all, that's all it does. Important, I guess, because you don't want that flinging back, but not entirely complex in design. Um, we're gonna cut this factory, see, oh no. <laughs> I thought maybe I could do that without them noticing. Uh, well, that didn't end up working. <laughs> That's it. Uh, interestingly, uh, there's just a, you know, a lead screw where you can adjust its height and positioning. And then there's actually a little tiny grub screw right here where you can adjust uh, presumably the pressure and then what speed it returns. Should we set it to a, like a one so it flings back full speed? <laughs> So I've loosened these grub screws. Let's dial this from a five. Or maybe I haven't loosened them enough. It seemed loose. It actually seems like the whole thing's gonna just come off. Let's dial this from a five down to a one, okay? I'll tighten this grub screw back. Whoa, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo, I like that better. 
The other way is too slow. Okay, well, Apple was at a five. What if we put it at a six? Because that's, you know, like really slow return. That's fancy, right? So let's, let's put it to the highest fancy mode. Okay, so there's number six. We'll tighten that grub screw back up. Okay, now watch this. Oh, now that feels premium. We're leaving it like that. Um, <laughs> okay, let's pull this little door off here. We've got a, another factory seal. Wow, I need a sharper knife. That is uh, looking really bad. And I'm pretty confident at this point that they're gonna make me buy this whole thing. Oh well. Okay. This. Oh. <laughs> That's just a battery. Is that a C cell? I think it is. Oh wow, hold on. You know what? <laughs> Look at this. It's designed for a C cell, but they just put in a double A. <laughs> Because uh, these batteries all have the same voltage, right? Uh, so it really just comes down to a matter of capacity. That is a lithium battery, size AA, 3.6 volts, that they put inside this adapter to make it a C cell size. What in the world? Okay, and then that just slides into this, uh, this dock right here. That battery tray is not super elegant. Okay, I'll deal with that in a second. And then you've got an insane amount of wires coming off of this control board to presumably the, the circuit or logic board. So let's get into there. Oh, you know what? I thought this was gonna be attached to the door. This is part of the uh, handle. There's a big gear drive in here. Oh, maybe it, yeah, okay. Oh no, holy crap. So they're using this for retention. This is just a linear rod. Oh my goodness. This handle is like got crazy nice gearing. There's an end stop there. And then there's just an insanely tightly wound spring. This is not something I wanna accidentally bump of <laughs> coming towards my face. But if I ger very gently spin that, look at that. Holy smokes. So this is a circular gear that runs along a linear gear track right here on the other side. So this extruded piece of aluminum presumably has this, uh, you know, screwed in somehow, or maybe that's milled or machined into the aluminum. Yeah, it looks like that's part of this aluminum track. And then on this front side, you've got a linear rod right here. So these are, these are really cool. There's a little carriage that sits in here and we can maybe try and pull it off where this bearing, it's, it's this little slider with like 30 tiny little ball bearings that run in a loop that will run along this track right here. That is, holy crap, that is not cheap to make. It's gotta be glued. You can see that's where our gear goes. And now we have all the goods. Wow. So that's uh, that's pretty bananas. This is one single piece of milled aluminum. You can see all the CNC marks and then it comes in and out to create this uh, rail track that goes up and down. Those are those, uh, those linear bearings that I was talking about. So the bearing balls slide along this tiny cavity up and down and there are multiple bearing trays. There's one here and there's one here because they've got four attachment points on both sides. So I, I already took two of these screws out, but that's half of one side of this upper bearing right here. Now, here's our display board. And uh, yeah, there's just this connector that's coming from that 3.6 volt uh, AA battery masquerading as a C-cell and says LED board. You can see all the traces on the back of the PCB. That's it, that's this whole carriage arm. And then the only other thing, which I'm not going to take apart because I don't wanna die, is uh, this bottom section, which has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight segments. And they are interestingly using different spring pressures. So these corner ones are really, really firm. And the middle one and these side ones are quite easy to push down. These are actually the easiest. There's almost no pressure over here, medium pressure here, and then an insane amount of pressure on these sides. And so as you push the phone down, it applies uh, different pressure levels to different portions of the phone, which makes sense. You want more pressure on the sides and uh, you know along the, the width of the phone than you do necessarily where the earpiece and face ID is and all of that stuff. So holy smokes, this is a cool piece of kit. And you can see this shield. I don't know 
why they did this. I guess they wanted to hide all of these screws. Oh, I guess, yeah. When you push these sections up, they do raise up. So you can see they're just sliding inside it. There's no bearing here. So it's just sliding up and down. Uh, and they, they don't want you to have to see that. It needs to be beautiful and hidden. This thing is super well engineered. Really cool. Okay, one thing I just realized putting it back together is how does it trigger the display? How does it know when to start the timer? And it's very, very simple. There's this little tiny kind of weird machined head that's drilled into this gear set. And all it does is hit this little switch right here. So as soon as it hits the set point, it locks into place, keeps pressure on that switch, and as soon as you release it, it, <laughs> it undoes the switch. That's very funny. You've got a buzzer right here as well. Um, and then three very interesting red buttons. Ooh, what do they do? The secret red buttons, I must know. Okay, the three buttons say set up and down, but I have tried a number of uh, kind of configurations and none of them allow me to change the time that the timer will last for, which is kind of a bummer. The buzzer is a lot louder with the door off, but look. Now we get to the big mama, the heated display press. This one's interesting for a few reasons. Unlike the other two pieces of gear we had looked at that are unbranded and unlabeled, this very much isn't. Um, it's Kunshan Maizai Fixture Technology Company. And there's actually even a model number that I looked up and uh, you can find a PDF manual online. Now, I don't know if this is specifically you know, designed for Apple and they're the only customer, and or if this is just a generalized heated display press and there's a bunch of these different trays that fit in for a bunch of different phones. But I'm guessing probably the former. Someone made it for Apple and uh, that is what Kung Shang Maizai Fixture Technology Company does. This is called the Hot Pocket, <laughs> which is a funny name. That's not what Apple calls it in the manuals, but it does say that in the product name, SVC Hot Pocket. And I've been told by a number of geniuses that it's frequently referred to in the stores as the Hot Pocket. This thing is really pretty basic. Um, there is a clamp on this side that tightens against the frame of the phone. There are cutouts for your buttons and for everything else that uh, doesn't need heat, specifically the antenna lines, which is kind of funny. There's a, there's a lip so that it doesn't supposedly melt that plastic. And then in here, I am assuming there are heating elements and probably a thermistor for each of these panels. You uh, can know that because there are two sets of pogo pins. Uh, this is, well, maybe for one side and then for the other, I don't know, or maybe power on one side and data pins on the other. But, uh, excuse me, those are pads and then the pogo pins are actually right here and they are definitely pogo pins. And then uh, for the top element, there is uh, the same thing. So uh, that's used for all iPhones, I guess, have the same heating top element because that's not on this tray. And that's where the top adhesive is heated up. However, as demonstrated in uh, the video we did, the top adhesive is by far the trickiest to get off. So I'm presuming they don't put that much heat up there. So let's open the trays up quick because, oh, look at that. That's an RFID badge. And that's plastic on our otherwise aluminum top deck. So that must be to tell the uh, device either, uh, you know, what, well, that's weird. Cause you would, maybe there are no data pins here. This is just heat and that's it. Cause this could convey any number of information, how long uh, to, to run the timer, to what set temperature it needs to achieve. So if they're doing that over RFID, these must just be pure power pins. Okay, whoa. <laughs> maybe I want to pull off all the panels. So yeah, you just have wires coming in. They're, they're covered in heat, uh, heat treated material so that it, when it runs or presses against the actual, you know, heated areas, it, hmm. <laughs> I might have to dissemble this further. This is definitely a thermistor wire, I'm thinking. Oh, and I'm slightly starting to strip that. So I'm gonna just move on to the next one. <laughs> Oh no, look at that. Okay, well we'll super glue that one back into position. All of these screws are very, 
These are plastic. Are these, all of these screws are plastic. What in the heck? Why? I'm presuming the reason they do that is since these are attached to the, what appear to be brass kind of heated segments, you don't want the technician pulling the tray out to burn themselves on these screw heads. So they're just, they're plastic. Okay, this is actually fairly straightforward and it, it, I think it answers the question. This is definitely a thermistor. I cannot get this door off. It is like bonded into place, even with the screws, they're starting to strip. So I'm just gonna leave it, but I, I guarantee you that's a thermistor wire. That's probably what two of these pins are. And then the other two are for power. And uh, that would make sense because there are six connectors uh, coming from this area. Uh, two go into each section for our positive and negative. And uh, if you go and look inside there, there's just a little heater cartridge. So this is exactly the same thing that you would find on like a 3D printer. And the reason they use, uh, I'm assuming this is brass, is because brass is extremely thermally conductive. So you put your little heater element down here, it gets super hot and it spreads and dissipates that heat across the whole area. And that's probably why the single thermistor, I'm surprised they only use one, because um, there's no thermistor down here. It would make sense that these two would be the same because theoretically they have the same thermal performance. The, you know, it's the same part. Um, but they put it far away, uh, presumably because that's where the heat will be the lowest. Um, the question then becomes though, why do the RFID thing? I mean, you've got room for more pins to pass other data. It's just bizarre. I guess it's simple. Tag tells it how long, what temperature, and then this goes, okay, turn on, there's a timer in here, and then it just waits for that thermistor to hit that set point, and that's it. That's really simple. Now it is time for the machine itself. We're gonna pull off this upper cowling, not with the Phillips screwdriver, because <laughs> this is uh, an Allen key again. Let's see how tight these are. No, that's not too bad, we can do that. Okay. Number one. I mean, this, this doesn't hold that many secrets because you can see inside. And then the bottom, I'm guessing is really simple. It's probably as simple as a, as a, a power supply because there's a fan vent on this side and then our main control board and display. And that's, that's probably it. I do want to see how that RFID reader works though. That's fascinating to me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you twist it in it. It comes off, there we go. This is really high quality steel. I mean, it's super, super, super sturdy. Wow, okay. Um, oh, that's not too bad. It looks like we've got a lot going on back here, but we really don't. Um, so this is a ginormous connector, look at this. Oh, 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 mama. That's got six pins, including a ground. And that goes over to, yeah, just to this section. So on the right and left, we've got our heater core wires. So these two pins on the tray are for our heating element. And then our tiny little thermistor wires go in there and there. Yeah, so that's for these two pins. Um, there are two more wires going in here, but it goes to this little fifth pin in the middle. So that's gotta be like a, an end stop of some sort to let the device know that the tray's been inserted. And then uh, we've got this, which is our upper bar. This goes through this own little, its own little connector right here. Oh, and that's got the same deal. So two heater wires and then two thermistors. And then there's this really pretty looking kind of maybe thermoplastic that's, I don't know, not obviously not conductive. It looks like captain tape and everything's wrapped in captain. These, these actually, it knows if the device is in there, it won't even turn on based on the conductivity of the phone, which is kind of cool. Okay. I'm dumb. It doesn't measure any sort of resistance to see if there's a phone in there. I'm stupid, I've overthought it. It's just this end stop right here. So this tells that there's a phone in there when it's all the way up. And when it's not up, it means there's no phone in the tray. <laughs> Cause I was thinking about it and I was like, wait a minute, there's no communication. <laughs> so yeah, it's simple. There's another end stop that I see right here. And that is because when it's finished its heating, it gets really, really loud and buzzes at you forever, but you're supposed to do work inside the tray. So once you lower it far enough that the cup is close to the display, it clicks that end stop, hear that? So that end stop triggers and then tells the machine, okay, they're working on removing the adhesive, shut up. You don't have to have your buzzer on. And then that 
yeah, that's everything that comes to this upper deck. So that's pretty simple. Let's get inside the bottom. <laughs> okay, here's a pro tip. I did void my factory warranty, but you can take this machine entirely apart without getting caught. Because these side panels don't need to come off. Wow, this is very basic. Okay, so we've got a DC power supply right here. This is an RPS 48 SF, or output is 48 volts. Uh, it's 128 volts, or excuse me, 120 volts at 4.8 amps. So that's like a 550-ish watt power supply. That's pretty crazy, although it does say RPS 400. So maybe it's a 400 watt power supply. In any case, pretty beefy. But that's because uh, we are heating up three, no, four uh, heating cartridges, which is, which is quite a lot. That's three times more than a 3D printer. Um, so it's pretty simple. You go from the power supply into this uh, board right here. This actually is marked 48 volts in, and then it immediately goes down to this step down board. So there's a buck converter with a bunch of, uh, with a bunch of DC, DC hardware. So this is coming out at probably 12, maybe 24 volts. Uh, it's not going 48 to the heater cartridges, I would not expect. And that's where these, these are all going to um, our heating elements. So these thinner wires go to the top one, these beefy, thicker, heavier gauge wires go to the other three that is inside of this hot pocket. We've then got our, uh, our display board that uh, is actually running an ARM chip. There is a, there's an ARM logo on there, which is pretty funny. Uh, there's a couple DINs, uh, dip switches right here. Uh, I don't know what those would do. And then we're going five volts out to the display harness. Um, so there's another DC step down to five volts. We've got, uh, yeah, goes to our display and to our speaker. So this is our buzzer down here. Um, and then we've got the display panel and that's it. We've got our little end stop right here, our emergency cutoff switch. And all this does is uh, interrupt our power on our power supply right here. So that's all that does. It cuts it off from the power supply itself rather than at the board. And then, oh my gosh, <laughs> inside the manual, there is a, well, there's a USB uh, B port on here, type B. So like printer cables and stuff. And Apple says, don't use this USB port. If you, ha if you got a USB cable in the box, dispose of it which is kind of funny, but makes sense because A, this whole unit is self-contained, but B, there's actually no communication. <laughs> they put this in there just to cover the hole. There's a USB-A port, but nothing, nothing's coming out of it. In fact, I don't even see a place where you could put USB on the board. I guess it could be in, a, in like a four pin header maybe. Uh, yeah, right there. So there you go. This thing is really simple. You've got your RFID board that goes directly, or, or uh, antenna that goes directly into the board, and that's it. I mean, this thing is really, honestly, very simple. And is that it? Are we done? I guess we're done. Thanks so much for watching. And uh, as always, stay snazzy.